Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Appreciate you having me. Um, uh, I'm, I guess, like uh, Jim mentioned, I'm Jordan. I'm with Nielsen. I'm with Microsoft, uh, Cloud Solution Architect. I've met with a number of, of you um, working with on different projects or just kind of training you on Azure. So here we're talking about containers. I think what you'll find a little confusing is we have so many offerings that sometimes it's hard to know which one to actually use. So hopefully I can dispel some of some of that, and if, if you guys decide to start using containers in Azure, right, you'll know maybe what offering that is best for your, your workload. Um, so we'll, we'll jump in and get started. So here's, I just want to mention this, if anybody goes to meetups, we do have, uh, I had to put a plug in here for our, for our Azure meetup, but we meet at the Adobe building, uh, having one tonight at Adobe on Azure Stack, which is running Azure in your own data center. Um, so if you're ever interested, you can just go out to the meetup site, look for Utah Microsoft Azure Meetup and sign up, uh, sign up for it there. So, so here's the agenda. <clears throat> um, and, and this is where I said there's a little confusion because you'll see the same names even with different acronyms, right? And, and so there's a lot of change going on in this space right now. It's a really popular space. So we'll talk about uh, just real briefly, just I think everybody knows what Azure is. Uh, I'm not going to touch too much on that. I'll show kind of a slide of our services in Azure. Um, we'll talk containers and, and why people are moving and companies are moving towards containers. Uh, we'll talk about some of our different service offerings around containers. So when you get a lot of containers, it's, it's, they can become hard to manage, some of those different um, orchestrators that we have in Azure, and we have a number of them. And then we have some, um, some other PaaS services as well, and then at the end we'll, we'll briefly talk about um, our partners that we work with that you can run their, you can run their platforms uh, in Azure if, if you so choose. So again, a lot of different offerings, and we'll, hopefully you walk away. What, what I hope you walk away today is the understanding of a little more about containers, why to use them, and what platform in Azure you could choose that would maybe be best fit for you guys. So, this is a little bit of an eyesore, I know, this slide, oh, so I, I apologize, but where, where containers are really focused are those three highlighted categories. So you can, obviously you can run Docker and, and containers on virtual machines, IaaS, you know, you have to manage, care for it, feed it, right? It's, it's, your, it's your pet. And then you move up into more uh, the, what we call the container service space. This still has a, a, um, some IaaS or, or virtual machine involvement. And then you move up uh, further there, you go to the, the platform space or the PaaS space. And we'll have some uh, tools that, um, we'll talk about there. So um, anyway, this is kind of a slide that show. I think we've added more regions and more services, but um, I don't want to, it's, it's busy enough as it is. So. So just one thing I want to mention, and I hear from a lot of customers, is they say, oh, right, we're going to containers and microservices. Well, um, one thing is that containers doesn't actually equal microservices, right? It's a, it can be, a, it, it's basically microservices is an architectural design approach to breaking apart applications into smaller discrete units. And containers is just a way and a tool that can help facilitate a microservices uh, architecture. Right, but it doesn't have. You don't have to run it in uh, in in containers, right? So there's all. They always are really tied close together, and they can be, but you can run something like in Service Fabric that we'll talk about, like a .NET uh, application where you can just feed it to Service Fabric without being in a container. So you don't actually have to do it that way. And actually, I think Morgan and, and Troy are actually leveraging Service Fabric locally in their data center, um, and we'll talk about that. So anyway. So everybody's heard of Docker, right? Is everybody, anybody not familiar with, with Docker in here? Okay, so, so a few. Um, <clears throat> Docker, containers have been around a long time. Docker just came around and made containers easy, easy to use. So they, um, like I said, they didn't invent them, uh, but they did make them easy. And the Docker, f kind of the whole framework is made up of these underlying services, the Docker CLI, the Docker engine, um, Docker has, is now, they're trying to make money because Docker's free, right? So they've built an orchestrator called Docker Swarm and Docker Enterprise Edition, which we'll briefly talk on at the, at the very end. But um, Docker really had a lot of credit to Docker. They really did start the, the container um, movement, though. So there are other container engines that you can use, like Rocket from CoreOS, uh, but I would say the, the de facto standard is, is, is Docker. So. So what is just, I have a few slides on just what is a container before we hop into 
the number of orchestrators and different things we have in Azure. So a container is the ability to take your code and your libraries and run it on a host, and they share the underlying, uh, underlying kernel of the OS, right? And what's nice about that is they become very small, right? All you have is your code, your libraries, and, and that's it. It's not a full virtual machine. It doesn't take you know, minutes and uh, 10, 20 minutes to spin up. It takes, in a matter of seconds, you have a container up and, and running. So they're very, they're very small and very, um, very fast. Um, let's see if there's anything here. The OS is interesting because it used to be this is just was a Linux uh, thing, but now we've added Docker to run on Windows, and so you can run containers on uh, Docker containers on Windows now. You can run, uh, but you can't actually mix it. You can't take a .NET container and run it on a Linux platform unless it's .NET uh, Core, right? So that's something you got to keep in mind as you, as, you, as you do that. But I would say <clears throat> Windows containers with, with Docker on Windows today is probably something you want to give another six months before it's really, really polished. We have some customers running it, but, but there's still a lot of work going on there. So I would say if, if you choose to do a Windows platform and Docker on top of that, you probably want to give it another few, another few months. So, Okay. And then, so uh, one more thing on containers, they're, they're isolated, right? You, you get into a container and it has its own network namespace, it has its own process namespace. It looks like you're just on a, on a VM, but, but you're not, right? You're, you're, you're in, inside of a container. And then all the underlying, uh, uh, the, your code and the libraries call the underlying kernel if it needs to do something. So any questions on that? Yeah, ask what questions if, uh, if, you, if you have any. Yeah? What's the licensing like? So if it's if it's Linux, if you're running like a so in a in Docker you have you start with a base image. So like you may start with a, maybe it's a Java Spring Boot base image or a Node base image. Those are all free because it's all it's all Linux. Um, in the Windows world, that's a that's a good question. I don't know if you I don't I don't know if you have to have a license like a Windows like a like data center license or I no you wouldn't have to actually have that. Because we take a base image like an IIS, IIS base image, or we take a um, there's like a .NET base image that you can that you can leverage. So the, it's it's all it's all free. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting mixed up there. <clears throat> yeah. So no licensing, no licensing there. Good question. So so why containers? And, and we were talking about this just as we started. The, the good part is it's an immutable environment. So it's one of those things where you create a container, the container doesn't change. If you have to change it, you create a brand new container. And then you keep doing that after every, after every deploy. So you do a new build of a container, ship that new container as you roll that new one out. You don't, you don't, keep, you don't like keep the existing one around. The old ones, you just kind of, you tag them and they just grow and you have a lot of different versions. And then you can clean up the old, the older versions at some point. The nice, also the nice part is you can run, if you have the Docker engine on your laptop or in, in Azure or in Google or in AWS, it runs the exact same way either way. And you can just do a Docker run, you pull it down as long as the Docker engine's there and it runs your code, right? I would say, and, and then it's, the, the other good thing about Docker is it's, it's fast, right? Your, your, your code, because you don't have all the overhead of like a whole machine coming up, it spins up almost instantaneously. And I'll show you a couple examples of that as we, uh, in some demos here. Um, <clears throat> and then, like it says, it's, it's not, it's, Docker is not microservices, but it promotes microservice architectures. So, so here's kind of what a container environment would, as you start out, looks like. You have, you have a VM, say, running in Azure, or one of our past services running a container. And you can see that, you know, say you have, what, 12, 12, 9, how many do we have here? Nine or whatever, so many containers, and, and that's fine. You could probably manage that on your own without an orchestrator, and, and everything would be everything would be good, right? But the problem comes when when you then start deploying all these containers, right? You have these small Docker images; they're running all over the place, and you're like, "Holy cow! This is like just Docker sprawl, right?" And this, when Docker came out, this is kind of what people ran into. They're like, "Oh, this is great technology, but I don't have anything to manage these containers." So. And then there's another, another slide. Oh, maybe I, uh, yeah, then it just said very quickly. So 
so you, you really do, if you start leveraging Docker, you really need something to, to manage it, whether that's Cloud Foundry, whether that's Kubernetes, whether that's Service Fabric, and we'll talk about all these. You need something to, to manage this and, and, and to work with, or it's just, it's, it's just not worth it. And some of the things that um, <clears throat> container orchestrators provide is scheduling. You know, how can I take a Docker image and, and schedule that container out across a, a cluster? Right, what about service discovery? If I need to contact a different service, how can I call that? Is it, what, what, what are the mechanisms? And usually it's through, done through DNS. Um, what about scaling? How do I scale up and scale back down? Um, we have some really cool stuff on that that I'll talk about. And then uh, logging, monitoring, just the whole, the whole thing, right? You have, to, you have to worry about all those things. And so that's what um, Azure can help with and that's what these orchestrators that we have can, can, can assist with. So. So the first one that we started out with probably two years ago was a product called Azure Container Service. And it's in Azure today. I'm actually not gonna do a demo of this because this product's kind of, um, kind of changing. Uh, but if you go into Azure, the Azure portal or the CLI or PowerShell, you can spin up an ACS cluster. And what happens is you, you pick what platform and what orchestrator you wanna use. And so you have Kubernetes you can choose from, you have Mesos or DCOS, from Mesosphere, and you have Docker Swarm. Those are the three that, and they're all open source. We, we spin it up for you, and then we kind of turn it over to you. You have to, at that point, have to manage the VMs and, and kind of care and feed for them after that. The good thing about that is we, we, we spin it up for you because these clusters aren't easy to spin up. The bad part about that is you still have to like figure out how to add new nodes to the cluster and and, and, and it's, it, it's, a, it's an okay product, but there's, there was definitely a lot of improvement that needed to be done there. So, um, so that's ACS, and I'll show you just, just kind of a slide here. Um, we end up providing, um, provisioning the infrastructure. We orchestrate, you know, setting up the cluster. That's all done on the back end through what they call an ARM template, which is a JSON document to spin up the infrastructure. And then you then come along and throw your application on top of, of one of those orchestrators. You can do that today, still supported, uh, but it is but it's changing and we'll talk about what's changing there. And a service that was just announced and, and, and kind of the direction that Microsoft is, is heading is around what we call, and this is where you have the same name but different acronym, is uh, the Azure Container Service. And that's around, uh, this is a managed PaaS platform around Kubernetes. So there's, uh, there's a big, uh, I don't know if you've seen just in the open source world and, and in the container world, Kubernetes is, is definitely got the momentum and, and winning and is probably going to probably win, right? I mean, not win, you, there's a lot of other products, but it, a lot of customers, especially even here in Utah, are using, have gone to and, and le are leveraging Kubernetes. So this was a product uh, created by Google uh, off of their internal platform they called Borg which, uh, and then Google does millions and millions of containers. Uh, they released this to the, to the open source community and everybody's kind of jumped on, uh, Microsoft and Amazon and Google and, and every, uh, really the four big cloud players, let's say, well, the three big cloud players, Google, AWS, and Azure all have uh, now a managed uh, Kubernetes offering. AWS is, is coming, it's not there yet. So anyway, this is ours uh, called AKS. Um, we have a, it's a, you really don't have to do anything. You run three CLI commands and you have a Kubernetes cluster. I'll show you a demo here in just a minute. And then you can just take your containers and start, start deploying those. It's, it's obviously it's a little more complicated than that because you've got to figure out, you know, what's your CI CD pipeline, which, what's the logging, what are a few things. So you do have to build a few things around it. But this is, uh, this is kind of the, the direction we're going. And then, so then the question comes like, well, what about, what about Mesos and what about Docker Swarm, right? Well, if you want to leverage those and use Docker Enterprise Edition or you want to leverage Mesosphere, you can go into what we call the Azure Marketplace. So in our Azure portal, we have a marketplace where, we have, where partners can, uh, we work with the partners to put their products in there. You can spin up those platforms. Uh, Cloud Foundry is one of those. So you can go into the marketplace, say, I want to spin up a Cloud Foundry cluster, and we spin it up, and, and then you get support and help from Cloud Foundry. Same with Docker, same with Red Hat, same with all of our partners. So. If you want to use more of a partner-based solution, that's what, uh, that's what you can do. Uh, <clears throat> this is just a little more, the good part, there's no VMs to, to, um, to work with, right? 
There's no patching required. You don't have to do, it. We, we patch the and, and upgrade the cluster for you. Um, there's an SLA, 99.95, and I, and I think we can go up to close to, at right now, 500 nodes, I think, in a, in a cluster. Um, so that's just a quick overview. And I, some of this may not be as interesting to the, to the .NET uh, folks, but um, I'll just see if there's anything here that's, that's interesting. So the, the one thing that maybe that's features here is hybrid clusters. So you'll be able to have Windows and Linux running in the same cluster. And, and if you submit a .NET container to the cluster, it'll run it obviously on a Windows, on a Windows machine. And if you submit a, uh, you know, like a, a Go application, it'll run it on a Linux machine. But they can actually co coincide in the same cluster together. So. And then you can, this just slide, you can provision them with the CLI, you can provision these with the portal, you can provision these um, with PowerShell. And if you so choose, you can be able to provision this with just the API. So I know that I, Gordon's team over there is just leveraging uh, Azure's APIs to do their configuration. So any questions so far, guys? We all good? Okay. Okay. And then if, if you are interested, um, we have, if you really want to manage and get customized and manage your own Kubernetes clusters, we have this, uh, this product called ACS Engine. It's, uh, it's on GitHub. You can go out and look at it today. And essentially, it'll, it will customize a, a ACS deployment for you. So um, if you want a different operating system, if you want a if you want different size nodes, if you want different networking behind the scenes, um, you go run it, it'll generate an ARM template for you, you provision, you feed that to Azure, and, uh, and, and, th and there you go. So if you want more customization, we've released something called ACS Engine. Okay. All right, so I know there's a lot of ACE, ACE, ACE three letter acronyms that starts with, with A here, but uh, the next one is, and this is where I think, and we're, we're seeing a lot of the future move to, is what they call ACI. So this is Azure Container Instance. So we have pre-provisioned infrastructure in Azure that's sitting there that you basically say, take my container and and it will take it and it's, it's automatically just spin it up for you. You don't have to, you don't have, to have a, a Kubernetes cluster or a Swarm cluster. It's just sitting there provisioned and you feed your container to this, what they call Azure Container Instance. Um, the nice thing about that and, and where I think, uh, and I'll show you here in just a second, is um, again, this is a lot of, sorry, a lot of this is tied to close to Kubernetes because that's a, a big direction that we're, we're going within Microsoft. I'll talk about a couple others here in just a minute. Um, but is enabling Kubernetes to talk to ACI. And where this is important is you have a Kubernetes cluster in Azure, a AKS cluster, a managed one that you spin up. And then you deploy a connector that will allow you to then say I want to scale my application, I have a, some front end app API that I want to scale or some web service I want to scale, I basically say here, feed the connector into AKS and then it will, um, when you need to scale, instead of scaling up VMs and waiting for nodes to come up in your cluster, it'll just reach out to ACI and run new containers in that, in that, uh, in that environment. So it's like instant scaling uh, that you haven't had before. And this is something that every cloud provider is kind of looking at now because you can have a small cluster, scale your app over in ACI, scale it back down, and then it caught, you know, saves you money. It, it's more convenient because you, you don't have to manage additional nodes coming in, in, in and out of the cluster. So this is, uh, I don't have a demo on this, but it does, it does, actually I think I do have a demo on this I can show you. So any questions on, on that? Yeah. So uh, help me understand here. I, I, um, so maybe I would uh, spin up my own Kubernetes cluster in uh, Azure. Mm -hmm. and maybe I'd say I want a 10 node cluster. I'm yep. going to be paying for those 10 VMs to be running whether there's anything running on, the, on them or not. Because it's, Correct. They're, they're my servers. Yep. But let's say you know, 10 is enough to you know, run my application usually, but maybe during a peak time I would want to like scale out into ACI. Correct. I could scale out into ACI and just pay for the instances while they're in use. And it's per Plus, second, per second billing. Yep. Okay. And yep. then one, once I, you know, scale back down, then I'm, you know, back. Uh, then you're back to your 10 node, 10 node cluster and you know the cost and everything associated there. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Gordon? What are the, uh, what are the triggers for scaling in those cases? 
Yeah, good question. So inside of, um, if you, and it depends what platform you leverage, inside of Kubernetes, they have what they call horizontal pod auto scaling. So uh, I don't, I'm not doing too much of a deep dive on Kubernetes today, but in Kubernetes, a, basically a, a container has to live inside what they call a pod. You uh, can set like CPU, memory metrics. Um, there's a whole bunch of different metrics that you can set to scale off those internally in the, in the cluster. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, auto, yeah, auto scaling. Yeah. So actually, let me back up. So that's, so that's, uh, yeah. There's two types of scaling. So there's, there's the auto scaling that you could scale up a number of pods. But if you needed to do nodes like we were talking about, then, then there's the metrics probably will be very similar, like CPU and memory and I don't know whatever. The metrics probably should be there. I don't know what you know. Like yeah, there's a certain amount of like requests, network requests, or uh, I'd have to check in exactly what they are, but yeah. So you'll have the ability either within the cluster to scale up, or you'll be able to scale additional nodes in the cluster by leveraging ACI, or you could just add additional nodes if you, if you so choose. But so. Just to clarify. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is, that a, is that a computer saying, hey, we're, we're seeing these metrics are hitting a threshold. We, we now, some automated process will auto scale me out. Correct. Such that a human is not involved. No human involvement, yep. Okay. Yep. And that, is that the normal methodology or or would somebody need to be watching that those metrics to say, hey, it appears we're hitting threshold and then manually instigate um, additional servers or whatever? Yeah, good good question. Yeah, it should all be all be automated. So the system either whether you uh, scale internal to the cluster and just bring up more containers, uh, with horizontal pod auto scaling that should all be done based on the metrics you define, so automatically, um, or whether you bring up more nodes and, and leverage ACI or something like that, should all be done based off of a certain threshold that you hit and then and scale. Yeah, it should be no manual intervention at all. And do those nodes drop off automatically also? After yes. The and you're back down to your threshold? Correct. You can set certain limits to where it's like after five minutes and I've, I've dropped below this threshold, then scale back down to whatever you define. Yeah. Yep, good question. Hey, Jordan, just one other yeah. quick question. Um, so your Arteno cluster would be live within our VNet. Using ACI, would that just use the public space? Uh, good question, yes. That comes up a lot. So right now, ACI uh, is the connector and the integration with Kubernetes is the, they, the pods get a public IP address. That, that's how ACI was originally just released. However, coming up very shortly, I don't have the next couple months, um, they're going to be able to, ACI is going to be able to make an ex extend into your own VNet though. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what a lot, of, a lot of customers have been asking about. Yep. Good question. Okay. Let me show you uh, just a quick demo of this and kind of what it looks like. Okay. So here's the Azure portal for those, uh, I've got a lot of tabs open there. <laughs> Make sure I get the right tab. And this little, this is nice because you can stay in the portal and run either Bash or PowerShell in what they call Cloud Shell right here at the bottom. So if it just, then I don't have to bring up a CLI and do it. I can just do it all in one window. But um, so I've already provisioned and what they call an AKS cluster that we talked about. Uh, it takes really three CLI commands to provision the cluster. So I, I'm not going to run through the CLI commands, but it only is a few commands and you wait a couple minutes and you have a cluster. And then in, and in Kubernetes, I know we're doing a lot of focus on Kubernetes, we'll, uh, we'll show you uh, there's, I have some nodes in this, uh, in this cluster. So I have one agent node, they call it, and this is where the containers are going to run. Um, and then how you actually define a workload uh, is, is through either YAML or, or JSON. And there's really two configuration files. There's a deployment that basically says how many replicas of your app, how many, where's your image, your Docker image coming from, um, uh, what else, like health checks, like readiness checks and health checks that you define. And then there's also what they call a service that says how do you want me to get to your application from the outside? Do you want it to go through a load balancer? Do you want it to just be internal to the cluster? So there's a number of things you can do there. So let me just quickly show you that. I'll have to make this bigger. So <clears throat> this is YAML. Um, oof. That's 
cloud shell is not. <laughs> this is Vim in the cloud shell, so it's a little bit. Uh, it's a little. I might have to cat it out. Anyway, you can kind of see. Right, you have. Um, here's a deployment. The container that I'm pulling down from GitHub is, is, a, is a Redis, a Redis cache uh, container. Um, it's going to listen on port six three seven nine, right? Internally, um, a few things like that. Then there's this service, which I'm kind of having a hard time in. Ah. In Vim, showing you this, but let me see if I can cat. There we go. So here's actually, and then here's the service. The really great thing that you'll you'll see about just about Kubernetes and the integration with cloud providers is you define a service, you say type load balancer, and it'll actually go out provision the load balancer for you. And, and put the, all of the, the machines behind that load balancer. So you don't have to do any load balancing configuration. You create your deployment, create your service, the load balancer's done for you. You don't have to go put a ticket in to have, have somebody add F, F5 rules or anything like that, right? That's all, it's all provision. So let me just, so let me just quickly kick that off. So you do a kubectl, kubectl is the command line client to interact with Kubernetes cluster. You do a create, and then what did I call this? Test.yaml, I have to do a dash of. And so then it creates those. And then if you do a kubectl get uh, pods, remember, are the containers that are, uh, are a container running in the Kubernetes cluster. They're, they're running, so that's how, fast, that's how fast containers come up and run. And then if I do a kubectl get service, which is, remember, the, how you access these containers, you can see that it's going out. It's pending right now, but it's, it's sorry, it's supposed to be. It's going out and it's creating a uh, Azure load balancer for you. So then in just a minute, I'll be able to hit this service through a load balancer um, by just running these, you know, a few commands. So, so it's pretty nice. Let me, let me see if uh, this does take just a second. The longest part of this actually is to go to Azure, do an API call to create the load balancer, and then wait for that load balancer to be created. So any questions on, on that? I know this is kind of a... Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming some knowledge of Kubernetes here too. So, um, if, if you ever if you ever want to do more of a deep dive on that, let, let me know. And kind of just the ins and outs of it. But that's AKS. So you spin up a cluster, a few commands, wait a few minutes, and then if you have your code in a container, that can be a .NET Core container. Um, we can provision Windows clusters right now in Kubernetes, but it's in a, it's kind of in a beta. It's kind of in a beta state. So, um, but .NET Core has been a pretty popular. Uh, one to run on top of a Linux platform. So, are you guys doing any .NET Core, Jim? Okay, yeah. So that says you created that nine hours ago. Does that mean you were up really late last night getting ready for this? Which one? The nine hours. Oh, I last night I was just I did do the testing. I did create the cluster real quickly last night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, good, good call out. So we'll we'll come back to that. And I'll show you. So what did we talk about? Okay, the next thing that's, that's interesting, and we're shifting away from Kubernetes here a bit in our AKS and that platform, is a product called Service Fabric. And I'm guessing, have you guys, anybody worked with Service Fabric in here, Patrick? Okay. So this is, Service Fabric um, is great. It is a, it has been mainly a .NET platform. So basically taking your .NET code and this is all integrated with Visual Studio. So if you actually go into your .NET, uh, like a project, and you go to deploy, you can actually have the option to deploy it to a service fabric cluster right in Azure, right from Visual Studio. Um, you have to have one provision. But it's, it's similar to Kubernetes in that it's a cluster. It manages your application. It can do multiple replicas. It can have health checks. It, it integrates with load balancing and creating load balancers. Um, at one point, the, the, the vision was if you're a Linux shop, then go Kubernetes. And if you're a Windows shop, then go Service Fabric. However, then this is where things start bleeding together a little bit. The Service Fabric team has added support for containers and for Linux. So now you can do, you kind of have to decide, well, what's, what's best for my organization? Is it, is it Service Fabric or is it, is it, uh, is it Kubernetes, right, and, and AKS or whatever? Because AKS or Kubernetes, you can run anywhere, any cloud, any data center. Same with Service Fabric, you can take the code Run it in your in your own data center. Run it in AWS. Run it in Azure. It's all it's all up to you, right? So, 
That's the nice part. Um, it, it is very great with .NET. Like if and this for like this group, this is something it might be very interesting for you guys. It's it's it is a great platform and actually it supports a lot of um, products behind the scenes in Azure. We run this. It like IoT. Um, I, I can't remember all the services. I have to get the slide, but there's a bunch of Azure services that this supports behind the scenes that in in, in our Azure uh, platform. Uh, anything else there that I want to mention? Okay. So this, I'm not gonna really walk through this. This is, I meant to take this out. This just kind of shows, um, you can bring a large, big old large application and feed it in service fabric, it runs just fine, or you can break it up and do, you know, kind of, uh, it really is meant for microservice architectures though. And I'll show you, kind of show you why here. So when you define an application and, and to get ready for service fabric, you create a, an application XML file and then you end up creating these services, uh, which are also XML files that are, that are kind of a subset of this application XML that says, here's my code, here's the configs for my code, here's any maybe data like Im static images or something like that. And, and this is, you can kind of, it's kind of hard to see there. Um, but then you just take that, um, and then you can do all this within .NET, and then you feed that to a service fabric cluster. The nice part about if you're a .NET, there is like a, uh, this emulation cluster they spin up for you uh, uh, that's part of, I don't think it's part of Visual Studio, I don't know exactly how that works, but you can kind of feed it to so I cut this emulated service fabric cluster, and you can kind of test it and see how it works with, before you actually go and deploy it into, into Azure. So really, I would say this is better integration into Visual Studio than, than some tools like Kubernetes, uh, because a lot of those, um, like the Kubernetes type stuff, you'll end up, um, well, you can definitely, you can still use, you can still use Visual Studio code if you're doing .NET, but if you're doing other development, like, you know, other Java and stuff like that, uh, maybe the integration's not as, as good, so. This just shows kind of, uh, the the XML, but how you would do it in a, in a container because I mentioned the Service Fabric now supports containers, so you can now actually say where you know what's the ports I'm listening on, um, what's my endpoints, where's my um, so like here, where is that? Here's like what registry? Whoops, what registry is it? Docker Hub or is my container located in? Um, Where's, let's see right here, I'm trying to see where we, well, that's where I pulled it from. What port is it gonna listen on? And, and it's also integrated with Azure load balancing and stuff too, so it'll do the same, same type of thing that Kubernetes does, okay? And we talked about this, you can run on other clouds, you can run a data center, you can run it on your dev, on your dev box. Any questions on Service Fabric, guys? It, you, should, you should test it out, it's really cool, you can run it right within, within, uh, within Visual Studio, so. Okay. So this one I just wanted to do a demo for. So we've talked about um, ACS. Um, so let me just recap real quickly. We've talked about ACS, which you can spin up in any number of orchestrator that you want. We've talked about um, AKS, and that's kind of the direction that we're going. So if you want to do Mesos or, or DCOS, you leverage the marketplace and spin up a part, the partner platform that way, right? And if you're going Kubernetes, leverage AKS. Um, you've got Service Fabric if you are looking to more .NET, but now we support containers, so you, now you kind of have to maybe compare each solution to see what, um, what is best for you guys. And then the last one is if you are doing like a container, you're just one, one off, two off containers, you don't need this, the whole orchestration engine to, to manage all this for you, we actually have part of our PaaS service. Is anybody using um, app services in here? Uh, Gordon, yep. So we have what they call web apps for containers, which is part of our application services now. So I'll just, I'll, let me just actually show you this. Close the, oh, let me actually see if this, I gotta make sure the, I gotta show you the application that we looked at earlier, because it's, it's amazing. So there's the, this does get a public IP. You can, kind of back to networking, you can set that to where you'll actually get an internal load balancer IP, so you don't actually have to have a, a public facing. Um, we'll see if the app is up and running. Yeah, okay. So there's, there's the application, right? It's not, it's, it's, it's pretty stupid, but you know, it's, it, at least it shows you that it, it comes up and, and works, so. Okay. 
So next is, you, here's, here's the Azure portal if you haven't seen it. Um, you can come in and do web app uh, for containers right here. And all you do is create. And you can actually do this within, uh, I believe you can do the same thing within Visual Studio. So you probably won't do it this way. You probably just you know, get your code, get your container ready, um, and then submit it to web app for containers, and then it will just do it instead of, this is just kind of a, just to show you, how, you know, an overview from the portal. So you have to give it a unique name here. We'll just give it something here. And then you configure a container, and this is where you pull it from. Um, and we didn't really talk about the registry, but a registry in the container world is once you have your code packaged up into a container, or what they, so, and then this is always interesting too. So you have a container and, a, and an image, and the difference between the two is a, uh, a container is a running image. So um, when you hear those two terms, that's, you know, an image is just the, your code sitting out somewhere, a container is actually when it comes up and starts running. But you can take that image with that has your code in your libraries and push that to a registry, and that's just a place to store it. So when you go to run it, you, have to, you can pull it from somewhere. Docker Hub is one of those. We have one in Azure called ACR, Azure Container Registry. Um, or or there's, Docker uh, has their own private registry as well that you can run. So anyway, here you just pick what the, where the location of, it, of that, of that uh, image, um, any, maybe any tags, whether, anyway, there's a number of different things you can do here. And then it'll know where to go grab it, and it will pull it and run that container for you. So let me just show you. We'll do Docker Hub, we'll do public, Nginx is always one, uh, a go-to. And you basically hit create. And like I said, this is good for kind of one-off, two-off, uh, if, you're, if you're not doing a whole lot of container orchestration. The nice part about, though, about the, the PaaS services, I'll show you that when this comes up, is there's a lot of cool things about um, uh, scaling and, and um, Basically, pick doing a stage, stage dev stage environment where you can where they what they call slots. Um, so let me show you that. So that created. Oops. Okay. Oh, I'm already there. Sorry. So here's the URL to the app, um, and then this is part. All of this is part of app services. So I'll, I won't spend how much time. I won't spend too much time on this, but. You have, let me just show you a couple quick things. You have what they call deployment slots, where you can say, add a slot. And you could say, I want to clone um, the current container. And I'm going to call this dev. And essentially, it creates an, a, a whole new um, instantiation of, of that. And then you can use this as your dev environment. You can use the other one as your prod environment. If you actually want to swap stage to prod, you can swap it, so it will we'll swap. So there's 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 a lot of cool things you can do you can do there. There's this is in um, currently in preview, but there's kind of a continuous delivery uh, type mechanism that you can set up for this. So you can go do a new build of a container, push it out, right? So this is this is kind of nice as well. Um, what else here? This is here's the scaling. So if I want to if I want to scale out or scale up, I can say enable auto scale, and then this is back. Um, to some of the questions earlier, here's where I can say, okay, I want to add one instance when the CPU hits this, so on and so forth. Or there's and there's a number of different metrics that you can pick from. Let's see, scale on metric, we could, yeah. So, any questions on that, guys? Gordon, are you doing any of this scaling uh, with your the PaaS stuff today? Yeah. Okay, okay. So that's kind of nice uh, as far as. Another, another way to do containers. And then the last thing, um, or the last thing is just talking about the partner, the partner play that we, that we have and all the partners that we actually work with. I'll give this a second to come up. So one of them is uh, Pivotal. And we actually uh, joined um, the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Uh, and, and we're, I don't know, a gold partner or something like that. But you can go into the Azure Marketplace. Um, and I. I I don't probably need to show you that, but and spin up a, a Pivotal Cloud Foundry cluster, right? And they'll you'll get support from Pivotal, and and we're supporting that, and and it's it's a very good partnership. Um, and this just kind of shows you, you know, for for Java developers uh, that are that are leveraging Cloud Foundry, um, 
that we that Azure is a great place to run to run Cloud Foundry. And then we also have a whole host of other partners: uh, Red Hat, OpenShift. Uh, you can run in Azure. Um, Core OS, Tectonic, Docker Enterprise Edition, uh, Mesos, uh, Fear, or what they call DCOS. So you can go in there and, and choose a number of those. Those are all integrated into Azure. You can deploy those in the marketplace if you want, if you so choose to run it that way. So then the question is, you know, what what offering do you choose? What's what's the best option? And um, I, you know, I, some some of those we can kind of answer. Like if you're .NET, then Service Fabric for sure. If uh, if you're .NET Core or maybe a Linux, then then I would say probably Kubernetes. Um, if you're kind of a one-off, two-off, you could use the the app service, right? There's a whole lot of the whole lot of offerings uh, that that you have. And then if you're really, you know, maybe you're a, a big Docker shop or a, or a Cloud Foundry shop, the pivotal the pivotal route may be a may be a good way to go because it's the same thing you're doing uh, on-prem. So, um, yeah. Any questions on any of that, guys? So I know that's a whole lot of it. There's a whole lot more on. You could dive into each one of these, but this will hopefully give you a kind of a high-level overview of the the offerings that we have in Azure today. So, so uh, Jim, Azure Stack, I thought was like a competing product to on-prem Cloud Foundry. You just said Cloud Foundry is running in Azure, so and you can run it in Azure Stack as well. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. Yep, so you can run, um, so how we do, just real quickly on Azure Stack, is, is we partner with Dell, Cisco, and Lenovo. They wheel it in, it's kind of a black box. You, you don't get access to underlying, you know, Hyper-V or anything like that. It's, you get a portal, just like you would in Azure, and then you spin up. And we have the same marketplace items that we do in Azure that we do in Azure Stack, so it looks exactly the same. The good part, though, is you do have a big CapEx investment there, the the Azure services are not billed the same as they are in Azure, so it's a lot lower billing model, and it comes right off of your whatever your commit was that you've whatever the church has committed, you know, to spend in Azure type type thing. So, so that's nice. Yeah, I know that Darren uh, Westbrook is there. They have a Cisco UCS chassis that they're looking or working to spin that up on just for some testing. So, yeah. Any other uh, any other questions? Guys, okay, that's all I had. So, okay, how much time do we need to this? Just a few minutes. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, thanks. Sir. Thanks, Jordan. You guys are doing some awesome stuff. Uh, I'm, I wasn't going to present anything. I was just going to kind of speak to speak to some of my notes here. So, uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you guys have already deployed an app to Cloud Foundry today? Okay, so uh, a good number of you. I, I'm assuming that uh, you guys went through the uh, .NET Stack, uh, uh, .NET Core Stack training, that like I did. Uh, awesome way to get uh, an introduction to those technologies. So, um, just wanted to kind of speak a, a little bit today about you know our our approved uh, platform, which is uh, Cloud Foundry, and uh, you know as you're uh, looking at uh, containers, uh, Cloud Foundry kind of sits at a higher level um, than you know some of these services that you you've seen today. Um, you know, with Cloud Foundry, you don't really actually go out and create the container. The platform does that for you. Um, so uh, you can certainly uh, create Docker images and deploy that to Cloud Foundry, but one nice benefit of Cloud Foundry is you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Um, you know, you can do a, a CF push on your .NET app and not worry about creating the container. And there's actually some great benefits about that too. Um, one of those benefits being automatic security patching. Um, I don't know if you guys are interested in thinking about like patch schedules, like, hey, how often should I be patching my containers? You know, should I be, you know, updating the operating system base uh, that my container is based off? You know, should I be doing that uh, weekly? Should I be doing that every, you know, six weeks, uh, every month? Uh, the nice thing about Cloud Foundry is you actually inherit that uh, by default. If you let Cloud Foundry make the container for you, it is also going to patch those containers for you. So that, that's something that, um, you know, we do offer Docker on Cloud Foundry, but I actually tell people that if you do that, um, you have to realize that you're assuming the responsibility of also patching that container. 
you know, Cloud Foundry can't patch your Docker containers for you. Um, so something to think about when you guys uh, are deploying apps, if you use Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, as, as a platform by just pushing up your code um, and let it build the container, then it's also going to patch your container for you. And we do that every six weeks. And the nice thing is too about uh, Cloud Foundry is you, you also get some standardization. You know, you've got several different teams represented here. And if you uh, are using the Cloud Foundry build pack to push your app, um, you know, each team that is doing that is going to, their app is going to look the same inside of Cloud Foundry. If you SSH out into the container and look at the structure, it's going to be the same across teams, which is really beneficial because then you can get, you know, some benefits from, uh, you know, hey, this team, you don't have to relearn, you know, reinvent the wheel every time you go from team to team. And, uh, you know, in addition, uh, Cloud Foundry can also make some assumptions uh, because you're letting Cloud Foundry uh, create the containers. Uh, you can, it, it also makes some assumptions too that it can scale up your app when it needs to. Like for example, when we're deploying an update of Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, updating the Cloud Foundry platform itself, we can actually scale your app, up, you know, maybe you've only got one instance, we will scale it up to two instances temporarily while that uh, VM is being updated and then go back down to one instance so your, your customers don't ever experience any downtime. So, you know, there, there's some, there's some, uh, there are some benefits of being at a higher level, but uh, you obviously also lose full control. You know, sometimes you're like, hey, I can't quite get my app to fit into what Cloud Foundry is expecting of me. And in that case, you have to start, uh, you know, looking at something like Docker or customizing a build pack, which is not very exciting or easy to do. So, I mean, that's really where Docker makes things a, a lot easier. Um, so that that's just kind of a that's just kind of a, a high level, you know, some things that I I was thinking about uh, during this presentation, and you know how Cloud Foundry kind of relates to to some of these services. Um, some things that we are thinking about is, you know, how do we make uh, Cloud Foundry part of this multi-region strategy? One of the benefits of these, you know, container services is you automatically inherit the fact that, uh, you know, Microsoft has got data centers around the world. And so it would be very easy to, uh, you know, for you to go today to, uh, you know, many different regions of the world where Cloud Foundry, you're going to have to engage our team and we'll have to, you know, figure out which regions uh, make sense. We don't have you know, a, a wide uh, deployment like uh, uh, Microsoft does today. Um, so, you know, just kind of in closing, I'm kind of curious what your guys' thoughts are on Cloud Foundry and where you say, see that playing and what, what you would like to see from our team, um, you know, maybe based on what you've uh, seen here today. So, question then. So, some of the benefits of Save off that container, we can push it to any environment. Um, if you do that at the Cloud Foundry level, though, you kind of lose that as well. So I can't, for instance, I can I, may, may I don't know, can I actually take a Cloud Foundry container, bring it onto my Windows machine, and then troubleshoot it to see? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and there's been a lot of new tooling around that. There's a, a project called CF Local, which would allow you to do that. Um, so you'd be able to, what it would actually do is if you wanted to pull down your app that's running in Cloud Foundry, it would actually dockerize it, basically create a Docker image, and then you would run it locally uh, as, a, as a Docker container. Um, so there is some tooling, uh, you know, starting around that. Um, that's been around, out for a while. Is there any ability to, like, promote Cloud Foundry containers, right? So I've got dev test and stage. Right now I'm doing push to each one. Can I just take one that's in... Yeah, that, that's a great question. That's something that I would love to do today. And uh, no, not right now. <laughs> but uh, they, they're working on it. Like if, uh, you know, we've been kind of watching the changes of the Cloud Foundry open source product project, which we use. And there's the, the version three of their API supports that sort of things. Uh, you know, the, the container type thing or the, the equivalent of a Docker image in Cloud Foundry is a droplet. 
and the, you know they're now uh, creating the ability to copy droplets around in the in the cloud and you know spin up new instances from from that droplet. So it's definitely in the in the pipeline, but yeah, today that's not possible. Good question. Yeah, that's that's a good question. We do have, you know, we provide some uh, limited auto scaling capabilities, but I'm kind of curious, you know, what what are the use cases that you're seeing? You know, what would you like to see more from Cloud Foundry in terms of auto scaling? Well, as an example, um, in our case, he has webcast is a service that's used primarily on the weekends, right? Mm -hmm. And not used as much during the week. And so we get a lot of a lot of uh, hit or a lot of uh, usage on the weekend where we'd like those services like our web APIs or others to be able to scale up based on that usage. Um, now you could you could scale it just based on the calendar, mm -hmm. which is one option, but the other would be on a on a per request I guess. As you're getting more and more requests and it seems your request level going up that it would auto scale uh, more instances up to load balance all my requests on well, those are some of the yeah, that's that's a good uh, that that's good feedback, and we've we've got a lot of dem you know it seems like we hear about the auto scaling a lot. You know, some people want to auto scale based on CPU. You know, if I'm running really high CPU, then start scaling out. Some people want you know, oh, if I'm running out of memory, start scaling me out. You know, or maybe there's a, a ratio. I say you know I can handle this many uh, uh, requests per instance, and then I want you to scale out. There's a, there's a various, you know, well, and then another one is with the new task queue service, you know, maybe I've got a worker working on a queue, and if the queue is getting backed up, then I want to scale out instances. So we've thought about, uh, you know, uh, several different ways of, of scaling out instances, and, you know, really all we have today is, um, is schedule-based. Um, you know, we've kind of investigated some of the other ones, and I would say that I think really the... This is this is me speaking, not as a platform as a service team, but my personal opinion is you'd probably get the best bang for your buck out of going to something like the you know uh, ACI where or AKS where you're paying only per container because because ultimately Cloud Foundry uh, we have runner VMs that support your apps, and so if we were deployed in Azure today, we would still be paying you know for 10 VMs whether anyone's using them or not. And the the advantage of uh, the you know this other service is that you know you can really we would be saving the church money by having you know that scale down during the week. I, I don't know. That's my that's my opinion. But once again, th this is Blaine speaking and, and not on, on behalf of the platform as a service team. Yeah, um, there's been talk of it being open sourced. It's a it's a pivotal, you know, uh, we run the open source uh, version of Cloud Foundry. Uh, pivotal has a paid licensed version of Cloud Foundry, which adds some uh, some additional tooling. That's one of those additional tools that we don't currently have. Um, yeah, it's it's something that we're interested in. If they open sourced it, then we'd be right on it. It's kind of hard to play the game like, should we write our own or should we wait a little bit? It kind of seems like they're going to open source it, so. I, I don't know. I think that that's, you know, depending on your demand, if it's like, oh, we have to have this, then, you know, maybe we should prioritize it in our backlog. Please come talk to us. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> he has? Okay. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, I think we have zero item on this. Yeah. I was going to ask you a question on, on the Cloud Foundry side. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you guys, um, so, so what is the plan to move some of that into more of a cloud-based model and, and then have customers that are closer in here in Utah access that and then other regions access those Cloud Foundry installations or, or what's I'm so, just more just more my curiosity and stuff. So are you talking about like uh, having our Cloud Foundry deployed in multiple regions? Yeah, multiple regions in like Azure or whatever cloud you get, you know. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a good question. We we actually have it on our roadmap this year to look into look at getting a Cloud Foundry, our open source Cloud Foundry, running in Azure, um, because we want to be able to go to many different regions. Today we have uh, you know a, a, a region in Ashburn, Virginia. Um, you know, hopefully give people some place out outside of the the West to deploy their apps. You know, in case you know disaster recovery type things. But 
Um, you know, as for as far as foreign regions, uh, we're, we're not there yet, but we're we're that's definitely something that's uh, foremost on our mind for this year. Okay. What's the? Sorry, I have one more question too. What's the? So you guys run the open source version, and obviously it's got to be a pretty large installation of, of Cloud Foundry. Yeah. What's has there ever been a? You run into something where you're like, oh, I, I bit a bug, and I'm not sure what's going on, and I and I don't have pivotal support. I have to go to the open source community. Has that ever been a, a challenge? Uh, you know, I'll be honest, the open source community is, is gold. I mean, we, we get really good response from the open source community better. Like I, I used to work on an, on, on an IBM product before I came to this team and I feel like I've been spoiled to have the uh, community that's extremely responsive, far more responsive than IBM ever was on our paid supported product. So that's, that's my current opinion on, and, and I think that, you know, those same people are, you know, oftentimes uh, pivotal, uh, pivotal employees that are, you know, a part of the open source project, uh, responding. So we, we've been spoiled. I know not all communities are like that, but yeah. It's nice to have Microsoft on the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, um, you know, uh, we, we would like to understand, uh, you know, your needs. Um, and we'd also like to understand uh, when our needs are falling short and you guys see that, hey, you know, something like Kubernetes is, is where we're going. Like, we would like to understand that and, and the use cases that are driving to that be, uh, you to do that um, so that we can, you know, better target our platform to your needs. We're, we're here for you guys. So anyways, that's, that's all I had. Thanks. Thanks,